My name is Jim Ryan, and I'm the president of UVA, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this democracy dialogue on the role of social media in democracy. Um, given the topic, and before we begin, um, I would just like to take a quick selfie. <laughs> Um, I need to post that to my social media account, otherwise this event would not have actually happened. Um, I have to confess at the beginning that I have mixed experience with social media. I don't consume much of it at all, to be honest, um, but I, or at least the royal eye, do post fairly frequently. Um, I see it as part necessary communications tool, um, part PR for UVA, and part, and maybe the most important part, of a way I can embarrass my children. Um, Fortunately, we have uh, two moderators here and two very special guests with us today to help us better understand the role of social media in strengthening or weakening democracy around the world. The promise of social media has been clear since the world watched young people mobilize in Egypt and Tunisia to overthrow dictatorships. Social media could connect and amplify marginalized or oppressed voices and add momentum to social movements. It could democratize the internet by giving a platform to individuals rather than corporations who controlled traditional media. And it seemed to be on the leading edge of digital innovations that were poised to energize societies through the power of human connection. But over the past decade, we've also seen a more sinister side of social media, one that has amplified disinformation authoritarianism, racism, and intolerance, and has threatened national security. Today's conversation will consider the relationship between social media and democracy, and the implications for elections, security, free speech, and consumer protection. I can't think of two people better positioned to offer their expertise than our distinguished panelists, Senator Mark Warner, Democrat from Virginia, and Barbara Comstock, former Republican Congresswoman from Virginia. Thank you both for being here and for lending us your perspectives and expertise. As you may know, the Democracy Dialogues are a series of conversations designed to model civil debate about some of the most challenging issues facing our democracy. I'd like to encourage all of those who are tuning in on live stream and those of you who are here in the audience to keep an open mind and to genuinely consider ideas that you might disagree with at first blush. I'd like to thank the UVA Karsh Institute of Democracy and the Miller Center for their help with organizing the Democracy Dialogues. This series is made possible thanks to the generous support of the George and Judy Marcus Democracy Praxis Fund, Ingrid and David Hang, and former rector and current Board of Visitor member, Jim Murray. Now it's my pleasure to turn it over to our moderators, Daniel Citron and Siva Vidya, Vidya, Nana, Vidya Nathan. I knew I was going to, I'm That's sorry. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I'll work on that. Daniel is a Jefferson Scholars Foundation Shank Distinguished Professor in Law and the Cattle and Chapman Professor of Law at UVA. She writes and teaches about privacy, free expression, and civil rights. She is also the recipient of the prestigious MacArthur, MacArthur Fellowship, otherwise known as the MacArthur Genius Grant. Siva is a Robertson Professor of Media Studies and Director of the Center for Media and Citizenship at UVA. His books include Anti-Social Media, How Facebook Disconnects Us and Undermines Democracy. Democracy. Siva, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today um, in person in this lovely room. It's been more than two years since I've been in this room, uh, and I know I feel a, a real rush uh, and uh, relief and satisfaction to see everybody. Uh, I also want to thank the hundreds of people who are joining us through uh, electronic means today, too. The fact that we can do all of that makes this event just that much more impactful and hopefully that much more lively and interesting. Uh, once uh, Danielle and I are through, uh, are exhausted with our questions for our distinguished panelists, uh, we're going to invite you to join us at the microphone in the back, maybe line up at the microphone in the back uh, as we get close, and uh, we will entertain some questions um, until we are kicked out of this room. Um, so let me introduce two people you know well, so perhaps this is a bit redundant. Um, to my immediate right, uh, to, uh, I guess, left to you, Barbara Comstock, uh, who is a senior advisor with Baker, Baker Donaldson, where she's active in the technology and cybersecurity areas. Uh, she also works in national security and space uh, and works on congressional investigations. Uh, 
Representative Comstock was elected to Congress in 2014 and served two terms representing Virginia's 10th congressional district, making her the first woman elected to that seat. She is a member of the Republican Party. Uh, to her right is Senator Mark Warner, a member of the Democratic Party. Uh, he is the United States Senator from Virginia, the senior Senator from Virginia. Uh, Senator Warner serves on the Senate Finance, Banking, Budget, and Rules Committees, as well as the Select Committee on Intelligence, where he is the chairman. And that will, I think, be the source of many of our questions and answers today. His work uh, on the Intelligence Committee intersects with many of the issues that we must discuss at this really crucial time. I'm going to turn it over to Danielle, who will uh, start us off. Thank you so much uh, for everyone for being here. It's, I have to say it's so magical being in person and this room is so beautiful. <laughs> uh, and I'm new to UVA, so it, uh, UVA Law School. So it's, thank you so much everyone for having us. So I'm gonna start us off. It might seem like a bomb throwing, but the Communication Decency Act, Section 230, right? That's the law passed in 1996 that provides a legal shield for online platforms for user-generated content. It's why in many respects, we had the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter. And at the same time, it is why we have non sites devoted to non-consensual pornography, child exploitation, uh, Russian disinformation run amok. Um, the legal shield ensures that you can solicit illegality and bear no responsibility. Um, and so there are two provisions of Section 230. One uh, provides le the legal shield for doing too little, so for under-filtering content. Um, it's Section 230C1, and that's the one provision I'm most interested in. Um, and I know you are, Senator Warner, uh, having worked with your office and some thoughts for reform. And, and then there's a second provision, right? Section 230C2, which provides a legal shield for filtering and blocking any sorts of content if you do it in good faith. Um, there's a debate now, I have to say, I'm always shocked when Section 230 is in the news. I feel like I've been batting on about this provision for 12 years and it was, it was very unpopular and no one cared for a long time. And today on Morning Joe, there's Joe Scarborough misunderstanding Section 230 for all of us this morning, um, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, everyone misunderstands Section 230, um, but I think the, the question for reform, rather than you're taking down too much information you're a private party, all of these platforms, they likely have a First Amendment right to do that, to decide the speech they want to associate with. Many want to force platforms to host the content they like and force them to, to take down the content they don't like, right? But the, I think the most interesting provision and the one that needs reform is Section 230C1. That's the under filtering. That's the, we get a free pass for hosting illegality right, and make lots of money off of targeted ads and the collection of information uh, from hosting destructive information. Um, so what do you think about reform efforts? Um, and I have my own proposal in mind, but I thought maybe instead of foisting it on all of you, which I've tried to do to your staffers to tell you the truth, um, uh, you know, what, what do you think of just the notion of reform? There are folks that say, don't touch it. Thou shalt not touch Section 230 is often the refrain that I hear. You're going to break the internet as we know it. So, so I thought I would just begin by a question of, do you think, what do you make of this Section 230 thing? Should we do anything? Is there a chance for bipartisan sort of efforts? Which one? Uh, which you, want? you start. All right. Well, <laughs> well thank you. Well, you have, with that question, so much for foreplay. <laughs> You know, that's kind of got right to the heart of it, right? right to it, man. Let me, first of all, let me just, one, it, it's, President Ryan, it's great to see you. It's great to be with my friend, Barbara Comstock. It's great to be back on grounds. And I'm glad, um, this is the two days in a row I've been in the rotunda. Um, you know, today we're dealing with the issues around democracy in the internet, which are challenging but nothing compared to what I was doing here yesterday afternoon, trying to make sure that we get regular mail service to everybody in Charlottesville and Abemarle County on a regular basis. You know? Isn't that the same issue? Well, it's a little, at least a little bit, it's a little bit, of it, yeah. Because obviously the postal service, you don't have as nearly as much um, first-class mail anymore because we've transferred the way we communicate. 
And what the professor just said, you know, Section 230 was created back when, uh, back in the 90s, when I used to be in the telecom business. Mm -hmm. And we had these new platforms. We didn't know what they were going to be. And we said, let's give them immunity um, so they're not responsible for any content. And if you thought back to kind of what, what was happening in the 90s, there were message boards and should you be really responsible for all the messages posted on these message boards. So it made a little bit of sense. It even had a generating idea that said, we ought to do this because if we don't, the content, the, the platforms um, won't be able to moderate anything. This was supposed to be a tool for moderation rather than a get out of jail free card that they developed it to. So I, I think, and, and there are, as I said, there's a whole lot of folks, I think who give a very disingenuous argument that, oh my gosh, if we touch this, it's gonna blow up all of the internet and all of the good that has come out of it. I, I fundamentally disagree with that argument. I also disagree with the argument um, because most of the reforms around section 230, and I've got a proposal that I'll, I'll get to in a moment, were really based upon only platforms of a certain size. So again, I think it's a spurious argument to say, oh, if we have this some responsibility, NUCO or startup over here won't be able to succeed. Um, and, and Section 230 already in the 26 years since it was passed, we've, we've made exceptions to Section 230. And we've made exceptions about child pornography. We've made exceptions about bomb making. We've made it, I, I think there was a, one other small carve out exception. Intellectual so, property. Yeah, in, in, in intellectual property. So there was like, so this is not some blanket immunity. Uh, and other nations, I mean, there's, there is a whole approach in the UK and Europe, and now since they're divided, where there was going to be a standard of care that an independent group would come about. And, and frankly, the Europeans have gone probably farther than where I would go because they're even making activity that is not illegal in the real world, potentially illegal on, on the internet. So that would be a, 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 a bit of a, uh, too far in my, so I've worked on some legislation, right? That I do think, will end up being bipartisan with the basic idea being, if I do some action that would be illegal in the real world in terms of discrimination or harassment, or if I'm a TV or radio station and I'm putting up you know, duplicitous advertising that leads to a scam, all those things are illegal in the tangible world I think simply say they should not be, they, you should be able to bring a suit on those cases in the virtual world, in, uh, on, onto the platforms. It doesn't guarantee that you will be successful, but it will say there ought to be some path to redress because the, 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 there's a um, classic uh, case, I and mean, again, you'll recall the name, it was, it's kind of known as the Grinder case, which yeah. gives you yeah. an example of how Section 230 has been taken to the extreme. Some guy met somebody on Grinder. I guess they had been an affair, and then the, the spurned partner spent all his efforts basically saying on, on this post, you know, mimicking that he's the other person and say, please come and bother me. I like people to come and wake me up or come bother me at work because I'm you know, in the market for sex at all times. And this poor other person just got harassed to, to an unbelievable level and couldn't even get injunctive relief on what would be obviously harassment in any other setting. So I think this is an area where we can skirt the line to protect. I mean, I think the internet in our first amendment clearly means you can say stupid stuff doesn't mean though that that right means that it then gets to be uh, broadcast to six billion people. So I think the, the, the line I've tried to draw and there are other approaches, I know you've got one and we, we, we ought to talk through it is if it's illegal in the tangible world, you ought to at least be able to bring a case in the virtual world.
in terms of, of a Section 230 reform. Representative Tiona, chairman, and thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, we do want to, you know, so, so often these days we want to have people work together and we uh, thrive for that bipartisan agreement. And, you know, Senator Warner has been part of that. I certainly uh, worked on that a lot when I was in. And Section 230, which I do think is the 26 words that changed the internet. It's a great book on that short little book by Jeff Kothoff yes. on that. Yes. But it was written by two very different politicians, a Democrat and a Republican, uh, Ron Wyden, a very liberal Democrat from Oregon, who's now a senator, he's a congressman at that time, and Chris Cox, who had served in the um, Reagan White House. He, in fighting communism, he had done something where he translated Pravda into English and I think 26 other, number of other languages, took the exact newspaper and wanted to show people how much disinformation Russia put out. He translated it into English and got it around because, you know, Right, the Soviet Union at that time was the Soviet Union, of course, didn't they, they didn't even like to have photocopiers because they didn't want information out there. So he was part of that. So these two very different philosophical, you know, uh, perspectives on politics came together and wrote this uh, bill that I mean, this section of the bill that I think really has in in large part served the Internet well. I do think right now we're seeing this moment of moral clarity from President Zelensky that is just so powerful because of social media. You know, like um, the president said, you know, when you, saw, when you saw the students and the uprising, the power that gave, we are seeing people just change, you know, Germany change on a, on a week, over a weekend, their views. And it's because of this man who is out there in the street saying, I'm staying here. You know, he is presenting that there's no gatekeepers. And that was the basic concept of Section 230, is no gatekeepers. Because how many of us have, you know, been on a network interview. Of course, Senator Warner has, occasionally I did, but you know, most of us don't get to do that. Most of us haven't been on cable. Most of us don't you know, necessarily, you know, you might submit an op-ed to the newspaper, but they may not run it or a letter to the editor. But with no gatekeepers, you go directly to the people. So to look at the good part of that, I think today you see Zelensky and what he's done and rallied the American people. I mean, on what issue, are the American people like 80 or 90% in agreement? You know, and even with the former president, you know, saying the things he said, um, the American people have seen this for themselves and seen that unfiltered um, good versus evil. So I, I do, and, and as, as the professor mentioned, um, me too, it was very much in the same way. I worked on those issues when I was in Congress. They came through social media. And they, um, I remember my sister had, who works in um, theater over the years, uh, it wasn't uh, Harvey Weinstein, but it was another guy who, a Hollywood guy who got caught up in this. And this woman had put up her unfiltered direct story of what happened to her from this Hollywood star. And my sister read it and said, and it was like 20, she was 25 years, she was, I can remember it like it was yesterday, this same guy. And she knew it because it was unfiltered, it was directly from that woman. And other women read it and did the same thing. And that happened with so many other people. It happened with Governor Cuomo. I think on the Black Lives Matter movement, that unfiltered, you know, seeing the video, everyone saw it and you couldn't deny it. And I think it had a very powerful, positive effect, even though, you know, there were certainly riots, there were bad things that happened too. But overall, that was a good thing that we all would hear directly from people in the hurt and the power of hearing that unfiltered voice that hadn't gotten through the media in many senses. You now see in traditional media, you see many more diverse voices. And I think that's in large part because of Black Lives Matter. And then January 6th, I think, is a big, big moment of moral clarity and seeing that directly. Um, the sedition hunters who you're probably familiar with who are online and today, to this day, still put up pictures of people who were in the Capitol saying, we haven't caught these guys yet. This is num they, they have numbers for them. People all over the country have been finding videos, uploading it and doing it. They are great assistance to the committee. And our former Virginia colleague, Denver Riggleman, who's doing incredible data analysis in finding Mark Meadows texts that were turned over in a jumble. I don't even think Mark Meadows knew what he had in there. They figured it out. Thank goodness. So while, and then of course, just getting through the pandemic, I think social media, whether it's education, but you know, my mom is a 
docent at the Smithsonian and other museums, and she continues her classes online because of that. We are able, you know, our kids are able to be educated such that it was, you know, still like to have them in the classroom. But we were able to reach all over the world when we travel. We now, you know, we, you know, you do not, if, if you don't have this in your hand when you leave the house, you go back for this before you go back for a kid you forgot, right? <laughs> you know, this is an essential thing to our lives. So I say all of that to say, we know there's a lot, this is very difficult and challenging to do, and it was brought to us by bipartisan political, uh, I think really good uh, leaders who wanted to have that unfiltered media get through. So as we do it, I, and, and legislation going forward, um, I think one of the reasons that it's not bipartisan at this point is because of a former guy who was president. Um, I think the 2016 campaign, which Senator Warner did great investigation of, and I think you know, continues to go on in the January 6th committee, a lot of Democrats thought Trump won because of Facebook, right? That's that's a me. That's a regular line out there. He won because of Facebook. Um, then in 2020, there just was a movie. Republicans think Trump lost because of Facebook. So of course it's every. It's not because of the voters. You know, we're not smart enough to figure this all out. Apparently, Facebook is you know telling us all what to think. Now I don't know about you, but the thing that could make me run for Donald, you know, vote for Donald Trump, no matter what any Russian bot put up. I didn't vote for him in 16, I didn't vote for him in 20. I was on a ticket with him, opposing him. I also didn't, wasn't, you know, didn't, didn't like the other guys. But um, I, I think that has been too much of the driving force in this. And oftentimes the reason uh, Morning Joe will say we need to get rid of 230. Trump says get rid of 230, yet on Truth Social, what does he have? He's using two, <laughs> on his disastrous Truth Social. It's going nowhere. It'll go the way of Trump, you know, stakes and Trump water and Trump airlines. But um, it does say, you know, you can't say anything bad about, you know, basically bad about Trump. There's something to the effect. You know, he has a, he, he wants to have Section 230 now that he has a, a company. So I do think the problem is it's falling along partisan lines because of the former president and because of his outsized impact on this debate. And that's why I love the fact that this in this Zelensky moment, social media has bypassed him. They've taken off the Russian bots. They've taken off the former president. I think I, I have no problem with that. They're able to take him off and take off Marjorie Green because of that ability to moderate. Republicans think we might, that social media moderates too much. Democrats seem to think we're not doing it enough. I'm more in sort of the uh, Goldilocks is just about right. <laughs> um, but we need to have a lot of improvement. And I think a lot of it on the board of National uh, Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I was talking with the professor before on these thousands of sites that are victimizing people and doing things. We have to find ways to work together with law enforcement and technology. And I can go into that more because we have this, the National Center does some great work on that, but we need more money and we need more collaboration there. And a lot of this is we have to get out of our silos and collaborate, Democrats and Republicans, but law enforcement and technology companies, professors, and all of the data that we have over these years I think will enable us to figure out what do we need? Do we need to have more penalties? Because you're going to investigate something if it's instead of a misdemeanor, it's a felony. I know in human trafficking that I worked on, we changed that in Virginia. We put a lot, you know, a lot more uh, on the federal level, a lot more felonies in that area because it wasn't being investigated because it wasn't serious. And I think the same thing with some of the election crimes that are going on. Maybe. Uh, former chiefs of staff who vote in a trailer park that they're not <laughs> registered to vote in. Maybe there needs to be some more serious uh, things there. But um, so, there. so uh, Senator Warner, I was really only half joking when I said the post office and the internet were the same issue. Uh, when, well, the reason we have a U.S. Postal Service is that uh, um, James Madison, Ben Franklin decided we needed it to uh, run a democratic republic, right? To be able to have an informed public. Uh, and Congress, in its wisdom in the 19th century, decided to create uh, a subsidy, a second class subsidy for periodicals. Uh, that's what keeps magazines like The Nation afloat, magazines like The National Review afloat, which is edited by EVA alum, I might point out. And, uh, and it has enriched the public sphere. Um, we're now in a situation where um, that seems to have been forgotten. Uh, and while I don't want to minimize the anxiety of not getting your catalogs delivered on time, um, we seem to have uh, stifled one of our major communication networks 
without any regard for democracy or even in antipathy toward democracy because the last election was so in so many ways um, dependent upon the postal service coming through. Now, the internet, as we've heard from our discussion of section 230 was supposed to be this beacon of democracy. Didn't turn out that way. We've heard that story. We all understand it too well. Uh, but it strikes me also that other areas of communication policy in the federal government have lost it, their um, focus on democracy. So we have issues before the FCC, issues before the FTC, issues before the Securities and Exchange Commission as uh, Elon Musk is about to find out about major communication networks, right? We're going to have all of these conversations in a fractured form. And at no point are we having a comprehensive policy discussion about what it would take to create a communication and media policy for the United States that enhanced democracy. Is that possible? Can we have that conversation in 2022 or maybe more importantly, 2024? Let me let me start. Well, let me also clarify because I, I, I'm not sure Barbara and I are fully in in discreet. I mean, oh, I think we're no, I, I, you know, I, I do think yeah, yeah. that you know the ability to all of the great things that happen on the internet. Sign me up. But I think the shield. I think the the problem with Section 230 has become this get out of jail free card on every item. And I do think there is, I, I've got my so-called safe tech app and, and the hurdle, frankly, if I dropped the component about civil rights protections, I'd have bipartisan support right now. Um, if it was just you know, injunctive relief, harassment, false advertising. I think the path on section 230 is going to actually start where there is broad bipartisan support around protection standards for kids. And the kids, the kids safe, safe online app, I think it's called, you know, will be the camel's nose under the tent on, on 230. And once those standards around kids, they'll ultimately rise. And again, the Brits and the Europeans are, are, are a little bit ahead of us. And I think this question about can we have this comprehensive conversation about democracy, I think is a really good one because I would argue, and, and let me come at it slightly different, that one of the things that we've done in this country um, that I'm hugely concerned about over, over the last 30 to 40 years, more 30 years, um, partially because of the dis dysfunction of where I still work and Barbara used to work, <laughs> is that we have given up the normal American approach where we usually were first in setting standards, rules, procedures, protocols for every innovation. No matter where the innovation took place, we got to set the rules. And really the internet was one of the first times um, that we seeded that, for example, like on the question of privacy. You know, we, uh, the, the European set privacy standards, we now have, have um, um, you know, individual states. It's kind of crazy to me that we don't have a national privacy standard, number one. I see this real time from my Intel position, I am gonna come back to democracy where we suddenly woke up, I'm a former telecom guy, Jim Murray was my, uh, your former rector was my, my business partner. Um, you know, in all of the things around the internet, communications, satellites, we got to set the rules. 5G, the next generation of wireless communications, the first time we didn't set the rules, China set the rules. And when I talk about China, I wanna make clear, my beef is with the Communist Party and President Xi, it's not with the Chinese people. I think it's really important to say that because otherwise you play exactly in on how China propagates its propaganda over the internet. And I think what we've seen now is in area after area, we are seeding that traditional American slash Western leadership on standard setting and protocol settings. And I think that is a huge issue well beyond the question of the internet and democracy. On the question of can we have this discussion, um, uh, a, a comprehensive communications policy discussion you know, as the intersection with democracy? I hope so, because the alternative um, is going to be that, that, you know, alternative universe approach. And I'm not sure how we fully sort this out, because if, you, if you're gonna have a functioning democracy, you've gotta have some common touch points that you can actually, people that disagree can actually trust and, you know, that runs not only into Section 230, it runs into First Amendment 
issues. Um, but I think it is absolutely necessary that we that we we do it. How how that whether that bubbles up from the community level or whether it starts in Congress, I think would probably be better to bubbling up from the community level. Um, and and while this is a obviously uh, a little bit um, you know extraordinarily challenging, I want to touch again on on the comment that Barbara made about um, about President Zelensky. You know, the last two or three years been pretty hard in this country, you know, and, and we, we've, you know, as somebody was on the floor of the Senate on January 6th, I saw something I never thought I'd see, you know, a group trying to overthrow an election in America. We obviously, and I, I, I want to commend Barbara, you know, for her, her courage on standing up to the former president. And that is a real challenge to do uh, as a Republican member of Congress. And I, I commend her on that, but we've lived through that. We lived through the dysfunction of, uh, of, of, um, you know, where I work still, you know, I do think social media pits us against each other. You know, we lived through COVID. I think there's really been a question, at least I've asked is, can the concepts that Mr. Jefferson talked about hundreds of years ago about liberal democracy, freedom of the press, of a democrat, uh, democracy, of uh, the ability to agree and disagree uh, respectfully, is that gonna be really successful in the 21st century? And are these authoritarian regimes, China, Allah, that have none of those, Will they be more successful? And the thing that that again, I think we, I feel, Barbara feels, and probably, I hope all of us feel, is that that kind of doubt we've had, the people of Ukraine are literally voting with their lives to say we will give up our lives to have the kind of system that you have in the West and we have specifically in America. And I think, and I've seen this a little bit even in Congress, is we ought to be shaking off some of that moral ambiguity. And I think it's time to kind of trumpet the fact that one, we are the good guys. For all our flaws, we still have the best system. And I do First think, and, and I do think we have an ability to uh, form this kind of uh, debate about democracy. And again, protecting those First Amendment rights, but still having some rules of the road. Yeah, I do. I do think we're at a time where that um, that discussion is is very vital, and and people are excited about having it. And I do think for universities, for young people, I and mean, I teach classes now too. I was like, your voice is so valuable. I mean, we are on so many issues a fifty fifty country, which is why it's hard to agree on some of these issues. But then when you see those moments of clarity, like with President Zelensky in Ukraine look how the people come together on january 6th despite the interpretation now as you said on the floor that night what did lindsey graham say i'm out <laughs> it's over i just saw this up front that lasted for almost a week <laughs> but but what happened after that i don't think with social media so much as it was people hurt people and this is a this is a flaw in and, and electeds and flaw in, in, in people who think these loud voices are the majority. And I think coming up now, you're going to see that they aren't in a lot of cases. People who are afraid of the former president, I think, are, you know, shrinking in real time. You know, you're going to see Governor Kemp win his primary in Georgia. You're going to see, um, well, I'd like to see Marjorie Green go by the wayside too, working on that. But because they're the loudest voices, a lot of people are scared. And a lot of people in Congress, I mean, we kind of, we, you know, depending on the year, Virginia's been a little purple, been blue, but I mean, I was, I was never supposed to be elected ever. I was in blue territory. And so it was always hard. But most of the members of Congress, most of the senators come from a very red area or a very blue area. So they listen to these extremes. And I don't think it's social media so much that drives it, because actually there was a study done by Harvard. I haven't gotten through it all yesterday, but it, the, the essence of it was people on social media are actually less polarized than the average because they're actually getting now actually for example twitter does lean a little left but when i mentioned things like black lives matters i remember when i often when i was in office i would track social media throughout my district a lot of community leaders a lot of things that were going on because i wanted to know about a problem if it came up soon and we had a racial incident um, where a it was in loudon county where a um an african-american schoolhouse that was being restored in the 1800s was defaced with vile and awful uh, swastikas and, and horrible uh, vile language. And it happened on a Saturday night. By Sunday morning, it's all over Twitter. My staff calls me, have you seen this? What's going on? Um, I see that 
you know, people who really understood what this was, you know, and how awful this was. They're saying, why, why aren't the police responding yet? Why, is, why hasn't the sheriff's office done something? I called my um, uh, chairman of the board there and she said, I'm really upset that they aren't doing more. I called the sheriff and I said, what's going on? You know, this is this is like nine, 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. You know, a lot of people are in church, you know, fortunately we caught each other. And he said, you know, we are getting on it. And the initial officers who were on the scene did not understand what that school was. They did not understand the what had happened there. So this by, by the, you know, within 12 hours, we were all, all the electeds, the law enforcement, we were all at that school. We were all committing to find who did it, committing money and doing everything. And I really do credit the power of social media to do that and then work through the problem, caught the people because the reward, we said and the kids, and it ended up being kids on a Saturday night. Got, I think they were drunk and did, you know, awful things. But, and the judge, I, I know two of the things they had to do is I think they had to go to the African American Museum. They had to do a lot of social service work in the community, also go to the Holocaust Museum and, and learn things. But that was a real teachable learning moment. And I, and I know our Muslim community, whenever there was an incident, a terrorism incident, they were immediately on social media. They were immediately doing things that I think was very powerful there. So I think it's often our leaders who listen to the loudest voices and don't trust their communities of good people. Because when I said, I said, that's not right. They, our, our police, they would go after that. So let's go and get everyone together because there's more commonality on these things and people give it credit. And, and that could have immediately gone into a war. You know, everyone was, getting, you didn't do the right thing. You didn't care. When in fact, it was just a misunderstanding that needed a community to come together and work on. So we often blame the media, the platform, when it's the, the leaders themselves who aren't doing the work, who aren't standing up, who aren't, after they say I'm out, they go back in when they shouldn't. And I think they, you know, so hold them accountable. You know, if they're down there at Mar-a-Lago because, you know, social media is beating them up and they don't have the, if they don't have the courage to stand up to him, you know, look at what Zelensky's doing. How can you be a leader? And so I don't think if you can't stand up to a few Twitter, you know, people attacking you or other things, then you shouldn't be in these jobs. And I think more people need to say that you're out. I'm not going to stick with you if you don't do that. But let me just the, the flip, though, you know, when we when we um, uh, in a bipartisan way, and, uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee launched the investigation into 2016 and we were we the intelligence community were totally caught off guard. We never thought, they never predicted how the Russians could manipulate um, social media. So let me give you just two very quick examples. Because I agree, Barbara, the idea of, you know, a vandalism act that suddenly uh, educates the community. Uh, amen. So uh, supportive. But somehow when you've got a Russian sponsored organization that called itself the Tennessee Republican Party, and they slightly used it in a different spelling than the official Tennessee Republican Party. It had about 10 times more followers than the official Tennessee Republican Party. I think that's a problem. I think when we saw, and this was the case, and, and I the think- the Tennessee that, Republican Party should come out and their leaders should say, and where we can do that role is say, this isn't real. This isn't, but, you know, but, it's- But let me give you the, yeah. uh, maybe an example. But I mean, your work was that's great. More, was that's more, um, uh, more similar to the example of the defacing of the church. Um, and, and I think the, the platforms have gotten better on some of this policing. But in 2016, the Russians created two organizations. It was kind of like the- uh, sons of, and I, these names would be slightly wrong, but the Sons of Texas, which was kind of a, a white um, uh, supremacist group based in Texas. And then there was like the United Muslims of Texas. These are both phony groups that had thousands of followers. They then put out an, a, a notice that said the white supremacist group, they said, we're going to have a big rally at this mosque in Houston. At the same time, the Russian group put out the information of, hey, these guys are coming to attack our mosque, so Muslims come and show support. Thank God the police were there. We could have had a riot. I'm not sure that that kind of foreign intervention, protected by Section 230, is a system that 
that we ought to abide by. But the Soviet Union and Russia has been doing that for years. And the well, EU, they get involved in the elections. You know, Betty's certainly wanting Le Pen to win in France. And, and we couldn't and even, we, we can't even be. get a bill passed that John McCain and actually Lindsay have been co-sponsors of that says, if you are, if you are advertising on social media, political ad, you ought to have the same disclosure requirements that you have if it's on television or radio. I don't think that's going to stifle free speech. Back in 2016, the Russians were not, they were even paying for their ads in, on Facebook in rubles. <laughs> not too far to say, maybe you ought to disclose that. So I think, I mean, that would, uh, election laws like that would be part of a comprehensive so, uh, media and communication policy that, it, again, if it worked around the constellation of democracy and what do we need to have a rich democratic republic in a media ecosystem we j are just getting used to, right? We're all babies when it comes to this stuff. Right? We're all figuring our way through it. We invented a bunch of stuff and now we're figuring out how to drive the car and it's, and it's not going well, right? But look, when I wrote my book about- I Facebook, think it is, go I think there is more agreement. And as I, when people sit down and start working on it, I think you can find some more common ground. And I think that when you found common ground with Senator Burr mm -hmm. on, on public, you know, on, on telling what's going on with that Russian disinformation. And I think in 2020, we were much more aware of that. It was getting taken down more. And now, certainly with the Zelensky in Ukraine, tons of that has been taken down. And they have been isolated and marginalized in a way that would have been nice maybe if that more of that was done. But we can educate the public, and, and your investigation has, has helped with that, too. Well, right? when, I, when I wrote my book about Facebook, I was reflecting a lot on the fact that you know, we had, uh, in this country, put someone into the White House or put someone into the presidency uh, who had, you know, inherited all his money from his father and had grown grapes for wine in Albemarle County and was, and was like a, a, you know, part of the real estate mogul uh, constellation in this country uh, and had not won the popular vote. Uh, and of course, I was talking about the election of 1800, mm -hmm. um, which was our election probably most filled with disinformation, misinformation and propaganda. Uh, it was a really ugly election. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and that historical approach makes us really face the fact that um, we've never had a squeaky clean public sphere, right? But what we have now is materially different because we have phenomena like scale, right? Nothing has ever reached the scale of Facebook with 3 billion users around the world. There are only 7.4 billion humans and 3 billion of them are on Facebook, 230 million. Americans are on Facebook. We've never had anything in the United States that reached 230 million Americans or even that percentage of Americans. We've never had such a personalized media system, one that reinforces your networks, your connections, your beliefs, your uh, affiliations, one that uh, algorithmically groups you uh, among like-minded people through Facebook groups, capital F, capital G, right? This is a whole new set of phenomenon. And this phenomenon, not only of scale, but algorithmic amplification is something we've also not confronted, either in terms of policy or in terms of our own sense of navigation. It, to us, it's all just flowing on a screen, right? So, so it strikes me that um, no one in Washington is, again, not just taking a comprehensive view about the effect of all of these different communication policies on democracy, but even taking a comprehensive view on the experience of this one large powerful company and the ways in which it fundamentally makes life different, commerce different and democracy different in the 21st century than for instance it was in 1800 when all we had was the post office and a few, uh, a few broad sheets that made it to a few eyes because we had very few voters. So what are the chances of having that kind of conversation that would be over and above the question of um, uh, the sort of, uh, any swooping uh, conversation ending um, uh, response that Facebook has censored me, therefore I'm against it, right? Because it has to be deeper than that. Is there a chance of having that kind of policy discussion? Well, let me, let me start. And I, I, you know, I, I know there's lots of questions about uh, where the bias on the social media is. I think the bias is for them to make more money. So if you lean left, you're gonna get reinforcing comments on the left. If you lean right, you're gonna get the similar on the right. But if you step back and you say, let's, let's look at this. And, and the, the premise that we started in the nineties was, and, you know, and I think Zuckerberg said this, you know, move fast and break things. You know, we're gonna let, we're gonna let this tool just go forward. And then in, in the aftermath, 
uh, to see if we should put some rules about that. And I think that's, you know, it moved a lot faster. I frankly, as we, as we look at kind of next generation of, of, of um, technology development, particularly AI, I, I think we ought to put some guidelines on the front end because if you think social media was a massive transformational item, it's nothing compared to what artificial intelligence will bring to our lives. But let me just step back in terms of saying where this regulatory framework um, uh, discussion is headed. I think it's in four buckets. The first, where again, I think there's a lot of, of agreement, basic questions around privacy, who owns your own data? Um, you know, the only reason we have not had a privacy bill in America is two relatively minor items uh, that frankly should be able to be resolved. That's federal a real, preemption. Uh, a real option for a real opportunity. It's for a real a federal privacy. preemption and the question of individual right to sue. And I think there is some efforts on that. And, and again, otherwise we're gonna end up with 50 different privacy laws and that's gonna be a crazy quilt work. The second bucket, and this is where, probably where I've spent the most of my time, is are there things that can make this system more competitive with kind of tweaks around the edges? So I got a bipartisan piece of legislation that says, uh, let's get rid of what's called dark patterns. You know, you get on a site, and you can't ever find no, you can only find click here, uh, you know, and, and you keep clicking along and you basically are being manipulated in a way that if it was any other medium would be viewed as inappropriate. Uh, I got a bill that's called data portability and interoperability. In, in the old days, as a former telecom guy, it used to be a real pain in the ass to change, your, change from one telephone company to another because you had to change numbers, it was a real pain. Then you could have number portability. It kind of became a lot easier, so it became more competitive. If you have data portability, you basically say, I'm tired of how I'm treated on Facebook, so I want to go to Nuco, but I still want to talk to my friends on Facebook. So that data portability, interoperability, and the platforms are actually starting to get us closer to that fact. I have no problem with the idea of, of the platforms um, monetizing our, our money. The, the idea, one of the things that's so crazy to me is when people say, gosh, Facebook and Google are free. No, they're not free at all. They are giant sucking sounds of taking your personal information and monetizing it. And Senator, you think that's okay? I think, let's put it like this. I'm not going to be so restrictive that they can't do it, but I do think we ought to know what the value of that data is. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that there is a little bit more of an, a, a fair exchange. Two other quick things, because um, I know we're getting the hook here. Um, the, you know, so there's a bunch of bills there, a lot of them bipartisan. Some of this stuff about um, coming forward with your algorithms. So there's some transparency there. Those are in the kind of the, the you know, can we, again, encourage more competition, lessen some of the power. The third bucket is section 230. And there's a series of, of reforms. And again, I think the Europeans are leading on that. And I think there is a way to maintain freedom of expression. And the fourth, where again, there's bipartisan, which is kind of the antitrust. Are these folks just too big? And is there too much self-service when you go on, Google, that you only get Google sponsored results first, or you go on Amazon and suddenly they're able to take any, and I say this, I'm happy that their second headquarters can be in Northern Virginia, but when they have such a preferred preference for their own product. So there is, I think all four of these, and I think actually we're going to be coming to, it's been slower than I'd like, but I think there will be, frankly, by maybe not by the midterms, but definitely by next year, a lot of this, I think will be have moved forward. Uh, before Danielle asks her next question, uh, I want to invite people to line up at the microphone so we can move to uh, audience questions in a few minutes. Please go ahead, Danielle. Okay, so Senator, you have um, a wonderful bill that stalled, but about emergency health data and uh, in response to sort of uses of information about COVID uh, and preventing discrimination around uh, data about one's health. And in the bill, in the preface, you, uh, it says that privacy is a civil right, by which I understood the bill to be about anti-discrimination commitments. But I want to invite us to think about privacy as a civil right, not only as the prevention of structural discrimination, discrimination, discriminatory uses of personal data, but also as a right that each and every one of us is owed, right, for human flourishing. And the idea that first parties, let's Facebook can sell our data to data brokers, to parties we have no control over, that can't be consistent with commitments to civil rights, right? 
And so um, I wonder what we thought about the notion, and this is at the heart of my book that's coming up, the fight for privacy. So that's why, you know, pitching it to you all here. Why not? <laughs> Active audience. Yeah, I've heard both of them. I'm, I'm pitching stuff too. So I'm not yeah, <laughs> and, I'm, and I promise I'm working with you guys on your 230 reform, right? Self -data too, so sell data too. I know they do. And <laughs> that Trump is, is and, a lot of and data. Yeah, contact, you're, you're so very right about that, data, right? So. That is the idea <laughs> of having meaningful data privacy reform is tough because of the uses of that data in all sorts of ways, including, of course, for political campaigns, right? Uh, and so the idea that we would have sort of thin procedural commitments about, hey, you can ask, you know, what, what data do you have about me? And can I take it with me? GDPR is thin in its procedural protections. We need substantive commitments that sort of minimize collection and minimize sale to third parties so that we're not exploited, as you said so well, right, given the example of dark patterns. And so I wondered what we thought about that. Would that have any legs, right? The idea that we have a data privacy regime that's even stronger than GDPR, right? That we, as you said so well, we set the standards. We're the beacon of democracy. We should be clear that Let's, GDPR is the General Data the, Protection Regulation, which operates in Europe. So another example of and there's a very the rest of the world kind of kind of And it's thin, for goodness sakes. Like we all think, oh, Europe has the best data protection laws. Nonsense, right? It's we have more transparency. We can give consent, right? We have some insight at scale. Do you guys go to websites and ask for your information? Virginia, we have a privacy law. California has a privacy law. Have you gone to every single site and every single company and said, hey, what data do you have on me? And stop selling it. Can you do that at scale? Absolutely not. There are 4,000 data brokers. We literally can't do that. Well, can we, can we possibly take that kernel of privacy as a civil right and make it meaningful? Stay tuned. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, let me just, let me make a couple of quick comments. One, I think we need a privacy law. Two, I think we need a lot more transparency. And I do think there would be a enormous value in as people make these decisions about their data, that they know what it's worth. I think that transparency of a value proposition, because my sense of a, because I'm still a market-based guy more than a regulatory guy, I think we could introduce a concept if we knew how much our data was worth. If your data is worth to, face, to, to the, Net world, you know, twelve dollars a month. And Barbara's is fifteen, and yours is twenty, and mine's eight. There's value there. I actually think the market could help. And one of the things I add, just to kind of go nerdier down the rabbit hole, you know, addition, in addition to data portability and interoperability, ought to be what I call delegability. So you could actually say, because it's such a hassle to figure out all these data brokers and follow this, I want to have this level of protection and I'm going to give up X amount of this value of my data for somebody to be my data protector. And that might be a way to intercede that doesn't get rid of all of the good things that come. I think the complexity, and you talk about healthcare, um, and, and I know you've got some writings on, you know, particularly intimate data and, and, and issues here. This is a really gnarly, gnarly issue because we're going to want all of the value that comes from a healthcare system that knows personalized medicine about me. How are you going to have that personalized medicine? Because somebody's going to have to be aggregating all of this personal data about you. And how you get that balance right about a more personalized medical system, but at the same time, not have that data resold or exposed a thousand different times. We desperately need help. And that didn't even touch the cybersecurity piece of this. So, um, do you want to respond or should yeah, we move yeah, to yeah, audience questions? Great. Sure. So we have a few I, minutes I for some. For thank you. Some of the for some uh, audience questions. Um, so you want to introduce yourself? And hey there, my name is Alex. I'm a UVA law student. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> a little high for me. I'm not the and one of my law tech fellows. All right. I was going to say first, thank you all for being here and having this conversation with us. And I wanted to follow up on Professor Citrin's point uh, regarding data privacy. And I, I apologize now for bringing up someone else's book. Uh, you should read her book too. It's great. Um, but UC Irvine Professor uh, Richard Hazen uh, in his new book, Cheap Speech, mentions that one of the most useful tools that could be helpful in uh, slowing the spread of misinformation, disinformation online is uh, no longer allowing the use of micro-targeting in political campaigning. 
Uh, essentially, his point being that if election centric online advertisements are used, for example, as a House candidate, their ad should be uh, directed towards the entire congressional district, thus preventing candidates speaking out of one side of their mouth to 18 to 25 year old people of color and out the other side of their mouth to 65 year old plus white folks, my grandparents. Um, now, knowing that candidate campaigns, you know, party committees, IEs, even PACs uh, all engage in this type of activity on behalf of member of Congress. Is, is there even an incentive for Congress to take any action here? I, I can't imagine Congress passing that <laughs> because it, they, that's something they do. But one of the things that, for example, I guess Facebook does, if I'm recalling correctly from my last election, is now all the ads do go up. So you can see how people are speaking differently to different audiences. It's, and right now, the thing is, there's never been more information available than there is now. You know, I mean, Marjorie Greene is upset she's off of Twitter, right? But then she's kicking out media from her town hall. She doesn't want to have anyone see what she's saying. So there's lots of uh, tools that you can use. So say if you're, you know, an opponent can see, you know, what you're saying in different places, and then they can tape that and show that. So I, I do think you want to be able to talk to your audiences. I, I, I'm not, I'm just saying from a practical standpoint, I can't imagine Congress is going to take away a tool that has actually helped them communicate. Say, I mean, say you want to communicate with, with seniors, you know, and you want to tell them here's, you know, fraud is a big problem for seniors. We want to tell you about this. And you know, so there's a lot of micro targeting that you do you know, for federal employees, for um, for groups that might be discriminated against. You want to let them know about things that are going on in the community. So I don't think you want to take that away. But transparency showing what people are doing and saying it's never been easier to catch somebody a, a member an elected official in a lie than ever before because everything's online everything's taped you can do the they were for this before they were against it you know put the tape together you can put it up online you don't even have to spend any money you just put it up on your facebook and say hey i was at this event and saw they said two different things i think that the respectful pushback there is essentially um we all knew that president trump was making tons of lies that didn't if, if you had the ability daylight, if you had the it. ability to go <laughs> on facebook and target ads saying we need to stop the steal to a group of people but not to another group of people how did that prevent january 6 from happening essentially like, well i mean that's why we're investigating i mean he did lose he, he did he lost but this, he then lost. You have these <laughs> folks that are essentially have members of congress saying that micro targeting yeah. is okay yeah. because we'll use it correctly but the other guys were okay with not using it correctly. So, so the question of micro-targeting is, is one that has been uh, subject to a lot of debate outside of the halls of Congress. But yeah. I, I think your point is taken that, that people in Congress, the people with the power to address it, have no incentive to address it, right? So this is one of the binds we have. It's a very effective tool for political communication that saves money and is very efficient. Uh, on the other hand, it, you know, transparency aside, it doesn't allow for full accountability. Um, which is why it's been part of the argument. But let's move on to the next question, please. Andrew. Yeah, thank you for a very engaging session. Uh, my name's Phil Bourne. I'm the Dean of the School of Data Science. All this talk about data is uh, really interesting to me. I, I want to sort of ask a question about action and reaction. So it seems that a lot of what happens in Congress and so forth is very reactionary after the fact. What worries me is things are moving such an incredible fast rate that as we move into Web 3.0, which we barely have touched yet, you mentioned AI, but that's only a small piece of it. And there's going to be such profound change. It seems that we really need to have ways uh, for how we can inform, be better informed about the future and, and act on it before, it, uh, before actually nefarious things happen. So. I'm wondering what we can do as academic institutions beyond what we're doing already to actually be facilitatory in this next wave, which is going to just be an acceleration of what we've seen already. And I'm sorry to say this will be the final response where we're being asked to wrap it all up. So please, either one of you would like to respond. To that. How can, let me make sure, how can academia get ahead of the curve as we go through the next wave of technology transformation? Well, it's really how academia can help you in government get ahead, bit farther ahead than you are now, perhaps? Well, I, 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 that's a great question. I wish I had a, a, a easy answer because candidly, academics don't traditionally do very well with politicians. And, and even in terms of talking, talking to each other, 
Uh, but I, I start, you know, uh, somebody who did have a bit of a tech background and now kind of got this national security piece. Um, I think the premise that we operated in the 90s, I think we became, we, we all became, both parties became kind of super techno optimists. You know, everything in technology moving forward was going to be good. And, you know, broad based, the Republicans kind of because it was in favor of these pro businesses. The Democrats loved these tech firms because they, you know, were kind of uh, some of the leadership were more democratic leaning. And the Obama administration fell in love with Silicon Valley. And I think we became such techno optimists that we didn't realize what, with all of the good things that we, Barbara's talked about and all of us talked about in terms of social media, there was also a dark underbelly. And we've been so slow on trying to catch up to that. And where I fear, and I, and I think about the book that Henry Kissinger and, uh, and Eric Schmidt just wrote about AI, where there's this, I think, almost techno-optimist, again, because who's going to be one of the biggest winners in AI? It'll be Google, you know, kind of says, we can figure out the rules later. I'm not sure in artificial intelligence, when we turn over functions of our military and functions how we run our life, we don't even have a good definition of AI. Where does big data, machine learning, and AI, you know, people use these terms interchangeably. We in the government don't have it figured out. But I, I would think we need a, I, I don't want us to go down the path on AI that we didn't went on social media and try to correct it 10 years ago because it may be impossible to correct. And then the final point I would make to the, the point I made earlier um, about China, you know, um, Russia, Soviet Union was a military threat and an ideological threat. It was never an economic threat. The United States has never faced a economic challenge of the nature of China that wants to compete and win in every technology basis and basically is, has created a surveillance state using existing technology that would make Orwell blush. And if we don't think about whether it's AI, quantum computing, life sciences, this host of other areas, and this is where academia does, has to be important to convince us that we need some rules for this, but we also need to make sure that we continue to make the kind of investment in the basic research mm -hmm. to stay competitive in this. And it can't just be, and there needs to be an alliance of technology, of democracies. I think one of the things I would hope that would come out of this, uh, uh, this, this challenge with uh, uh, Zelensky and Ukraine is, you know, democracies are standing up. And those who have not, for example, the Indias and Israels, I'm very disappointed. I'm support, I'm chair of the India caucus. I'm biggest consistent supporter of Israel um, in, in my whole career. But I fear that this kind of moral ambiguity when this fight is going on, democracies versus authoritarianism, you, you, I don't think you can stay on the sidelines. And I think academia ought to keep pressuring us, not on, on policy rules, but also on making sure that we make the kind of investments that we should. And last point I'll just make on this, apologize for going on. You know, Congress is slowly starting to wake up on this. You know, we've gone from making about a third of the semiconductors in the world down to about 10%. China's done the exact opposite, gone from about 10 to about a third. We finally, in a very bipartisan way, are putting $52 billion in to make sure that we both do the R&D and we build enough semiconductors so we have a supply chain that doesn't end up where we can't get chips to go into automobiles. And so the price of cars is next to gas, the biggest driver of inflation at this point. Not because we're not making good cars, because we just have lost that component part. So I do think there's a, a role for academia to help educate us as policymakers where we ought to invest, where we ought to uh, also you know, think through in a forward-leaning way, how we at least set some ground rules for each of these new technology developments. And I think the talent race is going to be so important. So you're right, for ac academia has to be a partner and there needs to, you know, people need to be out of their silos more. I think one of the things in government, which we saw during COVID and with healthcare, we need to be paying the people who, these experts, you know, getting experts into cybersecurity and government or a lot of AI and technology is very difficult because the private sector pays a lot more. So we need to look at the pay scales on those. So we are getting the talent but then we have the advantage. I mean, we have the number one companies right now, but right now the top 20 tech companies, 11 are US, nine are China. So if we don't keep you know, our edge here, it is going to be a very dangerous world. So being much more aggressive on the public private partnerships that we have, because our tech giants are the biggest investors in R&D right now. So when you add the additional money that Congress is doing now, plus what they're doing, we still can be ahead of China 
but and, and that's you know we didn't get into antitrust and those things but you know again tread carefully because we want to have our companies be the leaders because a company where china which misuses this you know we got to get ahead of them so when they start misusing it we have the talent and that may involve immigration, which again, you know, we, there's so many gangs of mm -hmm. six or eight that I we need to have place in America <laughs> where being a gang member is a good thing. Yes. And I think, you know, that's what, kind of what we, and I think, but it's also incumbent upon all of you to say you want people and leaders who are going to do those things, who are going to work together, but to bring that to people's attention. And at the end of the day, it's, I have more, I mean, I do have confidence in, and that the people are going to get this right, that they're going to stand up because they have this information and they know, and there's you know more people out there that are not like these shrill voices that too often drive leaders to be scared to do all the things that we've talked about here today, where I think there's much more, even if you don't agree on a bill or a policy, there's ways we can say, well, I want to solve that problem too. So let's all get together and figure out the 50 percent of things we can agree on and not hold the bill up forever so because we don't agree on the other 40 or 50 percent well that gives me a lot of hope uh, I, I think cooperation going forward and frankly better coordination between different branches of government i don't mean different parties but different elements of government could go a long way and it uh, yeah. I well, think thank, you, thank you, Phil. Um, and I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, I also especially want to thank uh, my co-host, Professor Danielle Citrone from the UVA School of Law. Uh, I, uh, but of course, our two special guests, Senator Warner, Representative Comstock, thank you for coming all this way to join us uh, and, um, and to everyone who came and to everyone who is online. Uh, we hope you uh, benefited from this. Uh, we wish you could have participated more if we had more time. Uh, but we're available, we're, uh, we're uh, findable. Um, let's keep this conversation going. Clearly we have so much more to talk about in the years to come. These problems are nowhere near being solved. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much.